it's a pleasure to be here virtually um, and um, hopefully um, I can tell you something about the research we've been doing at Rothamsted on making um, a novel source of omega-3 um, fish oils and why we think that's an important thing to do. Um, it started off as a project that we began um, about 25 years ago when we were based at um, uh, Long Ashton Research Station in the University of Bristol um, and we thought it was going to be you know a fairly simple thing that we could do in in a period of three or five years and the fact that I'm still talking about it now 25 years later tells you that it wasn't quite as as simple as we hoped it was going to be but um, you know along the way we've learned a lot and it's been um, a really I would say uh, quite remarkable in terms of what we've we've managed to achieve but also quite remarkable in what we've still got to do so really what I'm going to do today is tell you about very much about the why we're doing the project I'm not going to dwell on the nuts and bolts of how we've made our transgenic plants because I think that's quite quite boring even for the for the for the people who are interested in that uh, and really I just want to tell you much more about why we're doing it and what it is that we hope to achieve and maybe also a little bit about some of the barriers that we're facing in terms of how the technology can be translated. Um, so um, yeah let me just get started then so uh, uh, actually I've, I've, I've sort of slightly um, 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 what's the word I'm looking for slightly um, pompously maybe uh, included a biography of myself and I don't obviously normally do that when I'm giving a talk but because it's a virtual thing I thought it might it, it would give some give a slightly human aspect to my presentation um, and so I'm originally from Northern Ireland I was born and brought up in in in, in Northern Ireland I went to school in Belfast and went to university in in, um, um, in Nottingham and that's really where I sort of became interested in plant biotechnology because Nottingham was one of the first universities um, that was um, in, interested in plant biotechnology. I'm just got a checkpoint that's just come up on my. Uh, I've just had to put my security code into into this. Sorry if there was a slight interruption there. Um, so anyway, um, but I'm interested in plant biotechnology. Actually, and what I'm really interested in is in the application of plant biotechnology. I really want to see. I believe the technology has got great utility, um, and I, I really want to see it um, used to the benefit of of society and to the consumer, which is really why I've sort of stuck with this project because I'm so keen to see the developments and and the and the potential benefits of the technology of our omega-3 fish oils project being deployed, um, you know, out of the lab and into the field and ultimately of delivering benefit to the consumer. So that's really what my motivation is. So let me tell you as a context, I need to tell you about omega-3 long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids and sort of probably through the talk, I'll use the term either long omega-3 long chain PUFAs or omega-3 fish oils sort of interchangeably. And in my mind, they're effectively synonymous uh, and the, the the fatty acids I'm particularly interested in, they're written on the bottom of the slide there. They're these fatty acids called EPA or DHA, um, and they are uh, they are the, the ones that you find pretty much exclusively in omega-3 fish oils. Now they're important, these omega-3 fish oils, these omega-3 long chain PUFAs are important because they're beneficial for human health. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of slides in a minute to sort of just back up these statements. Um, uh, they're a limited natural resource because they're fish oils. You know, we're basically taking them out of the ocean, and and, and marine stocks are uh, are things that are are managed. But basically, it's sort of one-way traffic. We're taking stuff out, but we're not putting stuff back in again. Um, and there's no known plant source available for um, for these omega-3 long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, and also they're, they're a vital component of aquaculture and that's the bit that probably people are not familiar with but I'm so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about aquaculture and why these omega-3 fish oils play such an important role in aquaculture. And I just need um, to before, before I sort of dwell too much on all of this um, I just need to tell you a little bit about the nomenclature of, of fatty acids, which is a fairly dull and dry aspect to this, but it's important that everybody is on the same page now. 
Um, uh, and what I've, I've done here is show the fatty acid composition of either a range of different fish oils or a range of vegetable oils. So on the left hand side in blue are examples of fatty acids that are found in fish oils. Um, and you can see that actually their compositions all vary. So whether you compare a anchovy oil with a cod liver oil or whatever, everything, everything has got a slightly different composition. But the key thing is that they all contain these omega-3 long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are EPA and DHA, and those are the ones that are written in red uh, at the bottom. So that's um, their fa uh, fatty acids with 20 or 22 carbons. That's the first number before the colon and five or six, which is the number of unsaturations or double bonds that's written after the colon in red. So EPA and DHA are these omega-3 fish oils, these omega-3 long chain poofers. They're the things that are health beneficial. Those are the things we're interested in. And you can see fish oils contain them to, to varying levels. Not They're not super concentrated, um, but they're at significant levels in different fish oils. Now, if you look over on the right hand side in the green, you can see lots of different uh, uh, vegetable oils and you know soybean oil, palm oil, oilseed rape, sunflower, linseed. And you can see there is a zero return. There's a nil entry for EPA and DHA for those two in red that you find only in the fish oils. They just don't exist in plants. So there is no omega-3 fish oils in plants. Now, what's slightly confusing, and if I had a pound for every time people have, have, have asked me this question, I would be quite wealthy. Um, they sort of say, well, hang on, why are you doing this? Don't you know that, that, um, that flax oil or linseed oil is rich in omega-3s? And I, I guess they sort of expect me to sort of fall to my knees in rage and discover I've been wasting 25 years of my life. But it turns out that I haven't uh, because uh, omega 3s is just a classification for a, a whole family of fatty acids. It just tells you where the last double bond is at the end of the of the of the fatty acid chain. And there are omega-3 fatty acids present in plants and plants like linseed and flax do have very high levels of omega-3s, but they're not the same omega-3 type as the omega-3 long chain polyunsaturates. So the, the, you can find, for example, you can see on this slide that linseed could have up to 70% omega-3 fatty acids in its seed oils, but it's not the same omega-3 as those, as those found in fish oils. And crucially, it doesn't give you the same health benefits. So the, the, unfortunately, there is no natural plant source of omega-3 long chain polyunsaturates, though plants do, of course, contain omega-3s, just not the right type of omega-3s. Now, omega-3s have been known for quite a long time to be health beneficial. Probably the first evidence um, was, was epidemiological evidence that, was dis that was, became apparent in the 1970s. Um, looking at, uh, at populations that were eating and that had diets that were very rich in, 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 in fish and fish oils. Uh, and there was a correlation with um, reduced cardiovascular disease and, and also the sort of uh, aspects of, of the, the, their coagulation of their blood. So they had very, their blood was very, would actually um, coagulate very poorly, sh showing there was a reduced risk of, of, of heart attack and clotting. So this evidence has become really, really clear over the last 50 years, either from dietary intervention studies, epidemiological studies, and also genetic studies. So there's really good evidence that, that, um, that omega-3s are in, an important part of our diet. And certainly most health um, agencies across the planet would recommend that we have um, omega-3s as part of our, of, our, of our diet. And the reason that we should do that is because we can't make omega-3s ourselves. So these omega-3 long chain polyunsaturates pr are, are, are a crucial part of our diet because um, at least for DHA, we have no capacity to make it ourselves in our body. So it's really important to have it as part of our diet. And actually, if you went to your GP then they would say, actually, if you want to get more omega-3s into your diet, you should eat them as oily fish. So you should eat it as a whole food and not as a supplement. And that's another crucial thing is like it's really it really it's best to eat it as as a whole food. Um, but certainly it's clear that over the last 20 plus years, the amount of omega threes that we're getting into our diet is really, really low. And there's a whole number of reasons for that. And we can talk about that later. But it's certainly clear that that, you know, in general, uh, diseases like uh, metabolic diseases, which are diseases as a consequence not of undernutrition 
or lack of calories, but diseases as a consequence of poor, poor nutrition and overconsumption are, are now a massive global pandemic. Um, and so, you know, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, you know, these are these are global diseases that affect a very significant percentage of the of the global population. Um, and, uh, you know, and so one aspect to dealing with those problems is having a diet that contains omega three long chain polyunsaturates. It's not necessarily a magic bullet that's going to convert you from 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 being morbidly obese into into Usain Bolt but it is going to be something that can reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's really important that we have these fatty acids in our diet. Now, you know, and you know, here's a nice picture of a, of a salmon farm on, on the island of Shetland where, where I visited this facility uh, last year when, when one could do things like this. And the reason I put this picture in is because I need to tell you about aquaculture, about fish farming and why fish farming plays a crucial role in that delivery of omega-3 long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids into the human food web, and why it's so important, but also what the role of, of new sources of omega-3 long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids is important to aquaculture and why, why what we do is we think is, is, is useful. Some words about aquaculture. So, I mean, obviously in the top panel here, we know that the global population is increasing. Everybody knows this. You know, it's it's chastening in my in my lifetime that the global population has has more than doubled. Um, uh, and so this is, comes with all the attendant pressures that we're all really aware of in terms of, of, of pr producing enough food, but enough uh, of nutritious food for every mouth on the planet. Now, a lot of uh, a lot of the food that we eat is not um, is not just um, um, uh, produced is not say for example vegetable based or plant based. A lot of it obviously is animal in the animal form, um, and this is where one of the problems with feeding an ever growing population comes in because uh, if you're going to for example grow crops to feed to animals, which which we will then consume, this is a pretty inefficient process compared to just eating the crops themselves. Um, but, you know, obviously our food webs are configured around uh, around doing, you know, all of those things, either eating crops directly or eating them uh, after they've been uh, sort of, if you like, passaged through through animals. Now, aquaculture, it, I mean, fish farming is a really remarkable, uh, remarkably efficient way to produce protein for human consumption, uh, because compared to all other terrestrial forms of, of animal protein production, it is incredibly efficient. So the, the input output ratio for, 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 for protein in and protein out for farmed fish is pretty much is pretty much sort of like effectively one to one. Whereas obviously with lots of other animal species, it's much, much more inefficient. So you're putting so in the case of cows, beef, you're putting seven kilos in to get one kilo out, um, which is the, you know, the definition of inefficient. Um, so why is that relevant? Well, I mean, so it already tells you that aquaculture is a very efficient way to produce protein for, for human consumption. And as a consequence of that, and the consequence of the fact that the population is booming, aquaculture as an industry has, has transformed from being a pretty much negligible activity in the 1970s and 80s to being an enormous um, production system um, for, for, for producing food for human consumption in the last uh, 20 years. So basically all of, so for example, at one interesting statistic, all of the 53% um, of all of the fish that we consume on the planet is now produced by aquaculture, by fish farming, as opposed to wild capture. So the majority of all the fish, you know, and that includes all, you know, all, all the aquatic species we eat are produced by aquaculture. So it's an enormous industry. I don't think people realize how, how enormous it is. They sort of imagine that when they go to the supermarket, the things they see on the on the fishmonger's counter or in the in 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 the in the chiller cabinets have been caught by fishermen. In in most cases, they probably haven't. They've been produced. You know, the shrimps you eat, the 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 tuna, the salmon, you know, the trout, the sea bass, the sea bream. All of these things are farmed. So it's it's uh, it's it's um it's a really significant and important industry. Now, why am I telling you this? The, the one critical part of the story about this is that although aquaculture as an industry is booming, uh, one of its key inputs that it needs to produce the fish is fish oil. Now, that sounds slightly counterintuitive. Why would fish need fish oil? 
Well, it turns out that marine species and salmonid species like salmon and trout, all of those species are actually, you know, quite like quite like humans and mammals. They can't make omega-3 fish oils themselves. So they have to have them as dietary inputs just the same as we do. Now in the wild, a fish is basically swimming around in an, in an, uh, an environment that is incredibly rich in omega-3 fish oils. But in a fish farm, that's not the case. They're just in, in the pens and they're dependent on what the farmer feeds them. Um, and you can already imagine just looking at this graph, you look in these two bottom panels. So fish farming as an industry has massively increased, but the primary input, which is fish oils, has remained stable over a long period of time. It's just not increased because we are at the maximum level of sustainable production of omega-3 fish oils. There is no more. It turns out, you know, that thing about being plenty more fish in the sea, that's not true. There are not plenty more fish in the sea uh, and the av ability to produce omega-3 fish oils is really limited, is capped. So uh, this is a big problem. Um, and let me just flip through this slide. There's some animation here that I just need to get through. What's the consequence of that? Well, so fish farming aquaculture has tried, has been aware of this problem that omega-3 fish oils, their key component of the diet, has been is rate limiting, um, and they're trying to over the over the last few decades to deal with this by changing the diets that they feed the fish, so that they're no longer dependent on the omega-3 fish oils taking out of the ocean. So that's because that's where they come from. They're being harvested from their Peruvian anchovy stocks or from mahedron stocks on the east coast of the U.S. And these stocks are, are very much finite and under a great deal of pressure. So aquaculture has looked to, to other sources of oils to put into their diets for the fish. And this, this, this the bar chart really shows really starkly how the diets of fish, of farmed fish, have completely changed in the course of 25 years. And you can see, for example, this figure for 2016, that you know that 60% of the ingredients that go into, into, into farmed fish diets are no longer marine, that they're terrestrial, they're plant plant derived. Um, now that may not be a problem and it may help to make the, the fish aquaculture more sustainable, but there was one big unexpected consequence or unintended consequence of that, is that by shifting the diet of the fish away from marine ingredients and more to plant ingredients, to plant oil ingredients, they basically uh, decrease the amount of omega-3 long chain polyunsaturates in, for example, a salmon steak by more than half. Uh, and, and this graph shows this decline, historical decline from 2006 to 2016 of the amount of EPA and DHA. So these, remember, these are the fatty acids that are health beneficial. These are the ones that you want in your diet. And maybe these are even the reasons why you go out and buy a piece of oily fish because you want to have these fatty acids in your diet. But look, I mean, so the number is just so it's decreased by more than uh, uh, 50 percent, the amount of EPA and DHA in in, a, in farmed salmon. Now, um, the problem is that nobody told the consumer about this, um, and I, which I think is a little bit um, a, a little bit concerning. So to the point now that a farm salmon steak has got less than half of the omega threes, EPA and DHA in it than 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 it had ten years ago, and that's important because, as I've said, these are important fatty acids. They're important nutrients, and they can really reduce your risk of omega three uh, of of cardiovascular disease. And we really need to have them in our diet. So, but this is you know, so this this is a big problem, um, and so this is really the sort of context for where the urgency about our research and the importance of trying to translate it became even greater than than it was because actually when this this data came out and it was produced by our colleagues at the institute of aquaculture in sterling we just got to the point where we were able to make omega-3 long chain polyunsaturates in a crop plant and to levels that were sort of potentially would be useful so we'd sort of got to a point with our research where we would we, you know maybe if we were you know, you could do two things. One, you could just park your research on the on the on on the you know on the bench somewhere and sort of publish the paper and leave it to that. Or you could try and think about trying to translate it to deliver an impact. Uh, and so that's why we decided really we needed to try and translate our work and really try and um, and bring this technology out of the lab and into the field and into the real world because there was a real need for it and it could potentially do something really useful. 
So this was my vision. It was to make a omega-3 fish oils in a GM plant, but make it in a way that was actually going to be useful. Um, so not just make it in a model system or, or make it to really low levels. Um, and let me just give you a little quick refresher of how we how we did this um, from the outset. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that that you know fish don't make fish oils, um, um, and you know so it in, you know but the oceans are full of omega three long chain polyunsaturates, and the reason why the oceans are and the food webs in the marine environment are full of these fatty acids is because it's the marine microalgae that are making these omega three long chain PUFAs. Um, so they're the things at the very base of these aquatic food webs that make the fatty acids, which then get eaten by tiny fish, which get eaten by bigger fish and so on and so on. And the whole food web is basically rich in these these omega-3 long chain poofers. Um, so our idea was, OK, well, we just need to take the genes from these marine microalgae and put them into plants. And so these GM plants, which have now been engineered with the algal genes, will have the capacity to make omega-3 long chain polyunsaturates. Like I said, this was the idea we had 25 years ago, assuming it would be pretty straightforward. Um, and it pains me to say it was harder than I thought it was going to be. But, you know, at least it um, has kept us busy for 25 years. So why was it why was it harder than we thought? Well, some of it was because um, it's and this is probably the most complicated slide I'm going to show. So you'd be relieved to know. Um, it's quite complicated pathway engineering. So we we were trying to make these compounds in box in the red boxes, EPA and DHA. The plants normally only make the fatty acids that you see above the green line. So these linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid. So these are shorter chain forms. They're 18 carbon. They've got two or three double bonds. Um, and also the plants want to make a mixture of fatty acid types. They want to make omega-3 and omega-6. And we just want them to make omega-3 fatty acids. So you're sort of fighting against the plant to make it do something that it's not naturally configured to do uh, on top of adding in a whole suite of genes from uh, our marine microalgae to make it do, um, to make it make these unusual, well, these non-native fatty acids. So it's making something that it doesn't make as well as forcing it to make just omega-3 over uh, omega-6 fatty acids. So this was quite complicated to do. It involved putting a whole load of genes um, into the transgenic camelina. So we're putting seven or eight genes from that pathway I just showed you into our transgenic camelina. Um, uh, and, and we sort of did this um, um, by, uh, 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 well, we optimized this by an iterative approach. So basically what you're doing here is you're making a construct. You're transforming camelina. Camelina is really easy to genetically engineer. So it's, it's pretty much like un under, unlike any other oil seed crop. And it is a crop. It's a niche. It's a fairly niche crop, but it is grown um, at scale in, in 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 North America. It used to be grown a lot in Europe, up until about the First World War, and then it fell out of fashion. Um, so, but it is it is um, it is an oil seed crop. It's easy to genetically engineer, which makes life very easy for us, um, and it allows us to run this iterative cycle where you can test. Um, the, the, a new construct quite quickly. So you can grow at least three cycles of camelina every year. So it allows you to really cycle around this, this, um, this, this um, iteration to, to find the very best um, combinations of genes. And because we've got, as I say, so many genes in the plant, you've got to try and find the best combination. And so even probably, uh, you know, probably even before we we and we realized that there was a really pressing need for these omega threes, certainly to support the aquaculture industry, um, we'd already managed to make quite high levels of of EPA and DHA in our transgenic camelina plants. And so if you just look at this um, this this these the pie charts here on the left hand side, so the first one here that says wild type, just the one that's completely green. So that's a normal camelina seed. So it's not been transformed with any of our um, uh, uh, algal genes. And it's just making the regular vegetable fatty acids, making alpha linolenic acid and, and LA. Those were the two fatty acids I mentioned that plants normally accumulate. Um, um, and what we're trying to, to convert it to is a form that makes EPA and DHA. So the one beside it is, is a, a, a fish oil um, and that contains EPA and DHA. And if you look at the yellow cheeses sections, you can see that they're making, it's making about 25% EPA and DHA. So that's not a massive target to try and replicate, um, but certainly there is no plant that's naturally doing that. And if you look below that, you can see that in, in, our, in, our, 
engineered lines of camelina, we're already making nearly 10 percent uh, EPA and DHA in on average. Um, and in some of our plants, you can see um, up to 25 percent um, of EPA and DHA. So that's you know, that was super encouraging. Um, um, and you could argue, well, then, you know, what, you know, why did you not just stop stop there? Well, it turns out when you look at the fatty acid profile, it's not quite as ideal as you want. The EPA and DHA levels are really great, but we make quite a high level of of LA. You can see this maybe both on the pie chart, but also on the um, on the GC trace. So LA is an omega six fatty acid. And omega sixes and omega threes are a bit sort of yin and yang, and they sort of work in uh, they work against each other. So really, you don't want to have high levels of LA because that's going to sort of um, be counter counterproductive to the accumulation of EPA and DHA. And also, if you look in fish oils, which is the sort of thing that we're trying to replicate, the level of of LA in a fish oil is really low; it's less than one percent. So there was there was still some work to be done to try and optimize this. But it turns out that camelina, like I said, is really, really great for optimizing um, um, and, and doing these um, uh, these sort of iterative experiments. And these are just some this. is So this is a nice picture of camelina um, in the field at uh, Rothamsted. I mean, so this is one of our GM field trials, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, um, but um, we've tested lots and lots of new combinations of genes. And these are just you know, we're not, I'm not going to dwell on the combinations of genes. But you can sort of tweak around with the engineering of the plant to make it so that it changes whether you make just EPA or you're making EPA and DHA or the ratio of EPA and DHA. But also, and I didn't put it on this slide because it becomes more complicated. You can also reduce the total level of omega sixes and increase the omega omega three to omega six ratio. So camelina is a really nice system for us to do this iterative work. And actually, it turns out that camelina oil even the non-GM form is used quite a lot in aquaculture already as a source of, so I've mentioned that people use vegetable oils as a source of, of um, ingredients for, for a lot of aquafeed diets. So camelina oil is quite, is, is quite, uh, is used quite, uh, quite a lot because it's already a naturally high omega-3 crop. So it may, by which I mean it contains a lot of the alpha linoleic acid, that vegetable form, that shorter chain form, um, and you know, so that what is 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 used uh, as an ingredient already. So there's a lot of experience of using camelina oil in aquafeed already. Um, but you know, so for us, it was a, it's a nice crop because it is already a naturally high omega three crop, but not the right omega threes without the GM. Um, um, and this is this is a, a slide that I just wanted to show you. I'll just flick through the animation because you don't need the animation too much. Um, but this is something that we did to further enhance the levels of, of EPA and DHA. And what we did here, and I think this is relevant to, from a regulatory point of view, is we used gene editing on top of our GM. So our, all of our traits are our GM because you can only get EPA and DHA in the plants by adding in a fistful of algal genes. So that will always be genetic modification because you're adding in foreign DNA. Um, and you can't produce this trait alone by using gene editing. It's not possible to use just G gene editing to generate the omega-3 fish oil trait. But you can stack the two together to be slightly to be synergistic, which is what we did here. And if you just look at the at this um, in the box on the top panel on the graph, um, you can see that we used um, so the 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 yellow bars are. Uh, are where we've used gene editing to block a competing pathway on our on our on the oil synthesis in the plants so that it bumps up the levels of EPA and DHA. So you can, you know, so there is a benefit of using gene editing um, in our in our camelina, but you can't use it alone to 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 generate the omega-3 fish oil trait. You can use it in conjunction with the GM to enhance the G and, and amplify the GM trait, but it it, it only works if you've got those extra algal genes there as well. I just wanted to make that point clear because people sometimes think you can do the, you can use gene editing to, to, to achieve these things. This is a real example of, of, of what GM can do and gene editing cannot do. So sometimes there's a lot of, um, I wouldn't describe it as hype, but maybe there's a little bit of over expectation of what gene editing will be able to do. And in reality, it's quite limited because it really is just a mutagenesis technique. It's 
mutating out a particular gene, whereas GM is adding in a whole suite of genes. Think of it like that. Um, so let me tell you about doing our field trials. So I said really our motivation was, you know, we've got a plant, we've got some plants that made EPA and DHA to the same levels as you found in a fish oil. And that was really great. But really we wanted to do two things. One was test them in the field and one was was doing aquafeed trials to demonstrate, you know, is this really equivalent to a fish oil and will the crop perform in the field? Um, and you know, all our work up until this point had been done in a lab or in our GM greenhouses. So it was it, on one level, it was really exciting to go into the field and do field trials. And, and on one level, it was it was a little bit daunting because um, GM field trials in the UK in the preceding, well, there hadn't been any in the preceding decade. And in the 1990s, um, they were subject to um, some um, activists um, um, destroying these trials. Um, and even even a more recent trial at Rothamsted had been disrupted. A GM wheat trial had been disrupted by uh, by someone um, uh, trying to to disrupt to destroy the crop. Um, so it meant that you know we had um, there was a I'd be lying if I said there was no trepidation about doing these experiments in so much as that I was worried that my experiment would be destroyed. Um, but you know we'd learned a lot over the years of 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 how to run these trials. Um, you know, by which I don't necessarily mean we, we had a big fence, which is what you can see here. What was probably much more important was we realised is that it's really critical to explain why you're doing the experiments in the first place, which is why I've spent most of this talk telling you about why I think it's important to make omega-3 fish oils as opposed to telling you how I make omega-3 fish oils. I think it's really important to contextualize what it is you're doing and why it's important, why you believe it's important and what the benefits would be, for example, to the consumer or to the environment. So we spent we'd spent a lot of time um, explaining to anybody who would listen to us about why why we thought we, we doing these field trials was important. Um, and, and, you know, so this is a picture I always show and it shows uh, our farm manager going into our GM field trial compound at Harpenden and he's being filmed you know and people being filmed is now sort of thing you see continuously whenever there's a demonstration or something everybody's filming everybody else but actually here this is actually uh, a camera person from bbc country file and they're making a documentary about our gm field trials you know and that was another aspect of this that we were actually set on was we wanted to be as open and transparent as possible so anybody who wanted to visit our, our trial sites, whether they wanted to film it, whether they wanted to interview us, whether they just wanted to have a look around, we always said yes. Um, um, so it's it's really part of the whole process is really having um, a very, very clear strategy for communications based around being as open as possible. Uh, and then, you know, so, you know, these are just some pictures from our from our field trials over the years. This is, you know, we've managed to scale up. You know, the first year we did everything pretty much by hand. We were sowing by hand. We were harvesting by hand. It is no fun harvesting camelina with a pair of scissors, I can confirm. Um, you know, so, you know, the, two years later, when we were able to use our plot combine, which is what's shown here in the bottom, you know, that was a big relief. You know, it's really nice, but it also tells you you're starting to work at a technologically relevant scale. Um, you know, you're doing something that a farmer could understand if you're using a combine harvester. Um, and then, you know, you could move to a bigger scale. And, you know, we did some experiments in Manitoba where we needed to produce half a ton of camelina oil, um, you know, which is suddenly seems, you know, it doesn't seem like a, a big number, but if you're used to working just in a lab and lab scales, half a ton, 500 kilos of oil is an enormous volume because most of the time people are working in Eppendorf's um, and, and and dealing with very, very small volumes of liquid. You know, this is a, a monster amount of, of material and, and also has a whole load of logistics as well because you're growing the crop in one place, you're extracting the oil in another place, you're shipping the oil across the planet, the diets have to be formulated and then you run the trial in Scotland. Um, which, you know, is actually sort of analogous to the way sort of global markets um, of, and global commodities are moved around the planet. So it gives you a little insight into the way you need to think and how you, if you want to scale it up further. Um, and that was really exciting to be able to have a field of, you know, three hectares growing, you know, to produce enough oil to do a big feeding trial in Scotland. You know, that to me was really one of the most satisfying things that we've 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 done on this project. 
Um, and, and this, you know, ended up in his, I just put this picture on because it always reminds me that I need to get a haircut, but also it is a picture of um, um, me and my colleagues from the University of Stirling, so Douglas Toker and Monica Bettencourt, who were the sort of key collaborators from the aquafeed side, you know, we're standing in a salmon, you know, this is a salmon farm out in the, in, in, in the highlands of Scotland, you know, where our diets are being tested under com commercially relevant conditions. You know, to me, that's really exciting. And it's really exciting to have gone from, from you know, uh, quite humble beginnings for our project 20 years prior to that, to actually doing something that had real world relevance. Um, you know, and so that's why I think these things are, are, are you know, doing these sort of uh, translational activities, I think are really, are, are much more fulfilling than people that appreciate above and beyond the fact that, you know, there is a chance that you're, you're what you've developed will actually make it into the real world and will have an impact and will be useful. You know, I think that's great. Um, and I just sort of also on top of that, you know, there's there's a whole and there always has been issues where people would say, well, you know, you're working with GM. It's you know, it's dead in the water, no pun intended. Um, it's, you know, technology that nobody's going to adopt. People don't like it. You know, the public don't like it. I, you know, I am. That's not been our experience. You know, this is just from the times when we were doing, when we started doing our, our, our aqua feed trials um, and, and also doing the field trials, you know, and I think, you know, you can see this is not, um, this is not negative coverage, you know, and, it's, and this is not an atypical example of our coverage. You know, basically it tells you that if you, you know, if you explain what you're doing clearly and, and your motivation is hopefully right, then, you know, I think you can get a, um, there's a good chance that, that your, your, uh, your story will be covered fairly in the press. So I don't, and I really don't subscribe to this idea that the media is against, you know, against GM. I think they're, you know, they're, they're pretty agnostic. They just need to be convinced. Um, um, and anyway, so so uh, I just want to show you, I'm sort of moving towards the end here, but this is really um, some, um, you know, outputs. Uh, uh, these are just screenshots of publications that we've done, but mainly they're just to emphasize that we've done a lot of these aqua feed trials where we fed our novel oil to different plant, uh, different fish species. We've done it for salmon, we've done it for tuna, we've done it for sea bass, sea bream, trout, all of the important, economically important um, um, farm species. And the great news is that, that our novel omega-3 fish oil can exactly replicate the performance of the fish um, that, you know, when they're fed on a fish oil diet. You know, so that's really good. But I think the more important thing is that because we've produced our oil it by by plants by agriculture there is a possibility to almost produce an unlimited amount of of these omega-3 fish oils in the field and why is that important because as i told you right at the start the amount of omega-3s that are in the ocean is is completely limited and that's having an impact on the growth of aquaculture and the nutritional quality of the fish that we eat because there aren't enough omega-3 fish oils to go around. But if you have a new source, a, a plant-based source that can, can use agriculture to produce large, large volumes of omega-3s, then suddenly that, that pressure is relieved. And actually we could increase or rest, restore the levels of omega-3s that are present in fish, um, farmed fish back to the way they were 10 years ago, or even increase them so they're higher to make them more nutritious. You know, so I think that would be a really great thing to be able to do that. Um, and, and in fact, we've started also doing human studies with colleagues at the University of Southampton um, and Graham Burge and Philip Calder, who are really the experts in omega-3 nutrition in humans, to see also what happens if we provided our omega-3 fish oils from plants directly to human subjects, as opposed to them going through fish, which is the sort of more traditional route that we get them into, the, into our diet, but we're exploring direct nutrition as well. Um, so actually, I'm going to skip this slide because it's self, slightly self-aggrandizing, but it just says, you know, we've been doing a lot of work um, in the field. We're also doing um, additional work with our GM Camelina because Camelina is so nice to work with. So you can engineer the plants to, 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 do, to do other things or, or other useful things as well as the omega-3 trait. So, for example, actually, we've just engineered our plants. So they make not only make EPA and DHA, but they also make astaxanthin. What's astaxanthin? Astaxanthin is the pink pigment that actually gives, for example, salmon flesh the color that it that it has. 
Um, it's, I mean, uh, so in the wild, salmon get astaxanthin from eating uh, um, crustacea and a whole load of other material that has got that pink pigment in it. When they're in the pens, they don't have, have that. Um, and so it's important to have it in their diet because it's an antioxidant. Um, so we would like to be able to produce um, astaxanthin in our plants as well as the EPO and DHA because that would be a useful thing. And also having an antioxidant in the diet could reduce um, some of the stresses, the metabolic stresses the fish are subject to in the pens. Um, so, but that, all of that's great. So how do you get that from, um, from, you know, from a research phase into a development phase and in ultimately into a product? Uh, and this is, you know, um, the slightly chastening slide that I made, um, which is about how long it takes to, to convert an idea into a product. Um, and I gave it a snappy tongue twisting title of from field to fjord to fork, uh, which is easier to write than to say. But it really encapsulates what we're trying to do. We want to move from the field. So this is our growing our plants in the field um, and using aquaculture as a mechanism to deliver enhanced nutrition, better nutrition to the consumer. And that's what we want to do. But there's lots of hurdles, um, especially if you're at a publicly funded research institute like I am, because um, it, you know, actually it turns out that the bit that I've been doing is the easy bit. It's the next bit that's really tough, like getting regulatory approval to grow a GM crop at commercial scale, to navigating your way through intellectual property um, and, and also um, developing a business case. These are all the things, these are all expertise that we don't really in the main have um, in the academic sector. Um, so it's it's a real challenge to do that. And so you need to work in conjunction with, uh, with, with entities that do have that either as public private partnerships or um, some other mechanism because time is not on your side. Uh, um, innovation in agriculture takes a real long time. I, I like putting this slide up because it, it it's, um, and it's not my data, it's from a, an expert, uh, Philip Hardry in, in Minnesota, who analyzes this, he's an economist, um, and analyzes that on average, it takes 28 years for an innovation in agriculture to go from that light bulb moment that somebody has to something that is actually in the field. 28 years. So basically, you know, that's the guts of a scientific career. And the fastest example that, that, that anybody's produced has actually been probably the one that is most maligned, which is herbicide tolerance, Roundup Ready crops. They went from being an idea to being a commercial product in, in under 17 years. But most of the innovations take probably three decades and maybe longer. So it's sort of really chastening. So I'm, I'm sort of vaguely encouraged that my omega-3 stuff is still in the sort of, you know, we're still just about below the average time scale. Um, but, you know, I'm conscious that time is marching on. So it's really, it's something that is, is, is also a, a sort of motivation for me. And of course, and probably, and this is, I think, my last slide, but it's not doesn't mean this is the least important thing. It's probably, I've already touched on it, it's probably one of the most, if not the most important things, is all about consumer acceptance and social license. You really need to think really, really hard about how you will convey um, the, you know, and how consumer acceptance is going to, going to uh, welcome or not any product that you want to develop. Obviously, that's much more relevant with with GM, but actually, aquaculture is is an industry that has some problems with consumer acceptance and social license, which is really even just about you doing the research even before you get out of the lab and into the field. It's really that's really about you know whether people think what you're doing is a good thing or whether it has that yuck factor that people sometimes talk about. Um, you know, that's something that you, you th these are issues you can't duck. You really need to think about them and you really need to be able to articulate why it is you're doing it and why you think you can make a difference. And, and for the public, some of the key questions are, you know, who's paying and who's going to benefit? It's all about benefit. If you can articulate maybe how they're going to benefit, then maybe it's going to be an easier ride than if you say, well, actually, I'm just going to be, you know, it's just going to make this company more profitable. That's not be a, that's not a compelling argument. And don't always assume that the brilliance of your idea will carry the day because ultimately the consumer doesn't care about that. They're interested in really, that consumer is quite selfish. They're interested in how it's going to benefit them and, their, and them and theirs. Uh, 
so this is my summary. I think, um, you know, basically uh, we don't need to read or dwell too much on this. I think really the key thing is that we've used Camelina to make, uh, uh, you know, a robust, scalable source of omega-3 fish oils in plants. You know, we have the technology now to allow us to really do something that that is, I think, is on one level quite remarkable, but actually more importantly, actually quite useful. Um, and I think that's to me is the most exciting thing. Um, and that's really it. Um, you know, of course, I didn't do any of this work. I just take credit for it. Um, the people who really made them did all the heavy lifting was uh, Li Wa Han, who's the postdoc who works with me, and Richard and Olga and Noi and Sarah have worked uh, on the project over the years. <coughs> Excuse me. And I mentioned my colleagues, D Douglas and Monica at Sterling, um, who've, who've worked on the aquafeed stuff. This is a picture of our, our salmon farm uh, trial site in Scotland. Uh, which is, is beautiful. And also, if you look really carefully, that white puff of smoke is the Harry Potter Express running from Fort William to, to Malague. So three times a day, you can see the steam train running past as well. So that's another benefit as well when it's not raining.